So at this time, I'd like to call up Pastor Alonzo, not Barry, Pastor Alonzo, to come on up, and he's going to introduce his team. Give him a hand. Praise the Lord. It's it's an honor and a blessing to, to come and serve. Um, we love your pastors. Uh, and there's relationship up in Evergreen Center. Pastor Ron's brother, Pastor Barry, is also one of the staff pastors at Evergreen Center. So he sends his welcome to, to all of you. Evergreen Center, located in a small community in Elman, Wisconsin. I believe the population is 250. <clears throat> we have a small congregation, but we have a discipleship program where students come and live in uh, for a year. And we want to disciple them and direct them in the way of the Lord. Um, we, we want it to be a place where it's easy to find Jesus because that's most important. And, and once they begin to see that it's not just Jesus, but he is after them in a very special way, and he deals with them and brings them to a place where they can finally surrender their hearts and lives and begin to move out in the direction that he has called them into. So this morning we're going to have five of our interns come and share with you a personal word of testimony, okay? And so the first one, this morning, I think, is going to be Megan. Megan hails from Faroqua, Wisconsin, and she is our first term intern, and she's here with her husband, who is a former graduate of Evergreen Center. So, Megan, would you come in and share with us? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Megan, and... Um, I, before being at Evergreen, came from the Viroqua area in Wisconsin, and um, I grew up in a Christian home and have known the Lord since I was little, um, but it's been a process of the Lord working that out in my life personally, um, just taking it from something that I grew up knowing to something that He's making mine, and this morning... As I thought about what to share, I was struggling um, because the Lord's the Lord's made things real in my life, um, but I've struggled to walk in those things. He's made them real, but so often I have struggled, and even especially lately, um, to hold on to those things. Um, so I just say that up front. Um, but this morning. Um, Bear with me, I'm a little bit nervous to stand in front of a lot of people. <laughs> this morning I'd like to just encourage you all um, just to, to trust the Lord and to have faith in Him. Um, several weeks ago I was reading out of Luke, um, Luke 8, and it's a story of when Jesus calms the sea and his disciples are in the boat and they're they're afraid and they come to him and they say master master um, we're perishing and then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and there was a calm but he said to them where is your faith um, that goes on from there uh, but that stood out to me he said where is your faith and in my own life there was things that I was struggling with you know just feeling like I didn't feel like I even had what I needed to go forward with the Lord, but just realizing, where is my faith? Am I trusting that He can work this out in my life? In Exodus 16, um, the Lord had brought the children of Israel um, out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and He had brought them through the Red Sea. He divided the sea, and they walked through on dry land, and He had delivered them just mightily, and just Time and again, he had shown them how he could deliver them. Um, but then they get out in the, um, let's see, I think here they're, yeah, they're in the wilderness. And it says, and the children of Israel said to them, um, that's Moses and Aaron, sorry. So said to Moses and Aaron, oh, that we had died by the hand, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. 
when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. And when you read it, you just think, why did they have such a problem trusting the Lord? I mean, the Lord had been faithful. He divided the Red Sea. I mean, it was so obvious. Like, why were they trusting, the, you know, not trusting the Lord? But realizing how often we do that in our own lives, that the Lord's come through for us again and again, and we still, we get in another situation. It's like, Lord, are you going to do it this time? Are you going to do it this time? And we just panic. But the Lord's faithful every time, and I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't find the verse, but the verse that says the Lord is the same, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He's faithful, and it doesn't matter if the situation is different, the Lord's still faithful. So I just wanted to encourage you all this morning, um, just to, just that the Lord is faithful. So, thank you. Let's move on here. Um, Anthony Tomley, who hails from Detroit, will come and share next what the Lord has done in and through his life, okay? I'm not supposed to be here this morning, but my best friend was willing to die for me, so I'm able to stand. My best friend had to die. Jesus had to die for me to even testify what he's done for me my life. I thank him for that. Um, before I came to the Lord, I was in a very dark place. I'm just going to share a little bit on that. I wasn't saved. At one point in my life, I thought I was saved. I got my go to heaven pass. But then I ended up turning away from the Lord. And I turned away so far that one night, I wrote on a piece of paper and I was just in really darkness. It was like darkness attracted me. I liked it. It was like I liked doing bad things. It was just a rebellious spirit within me. I wanted to do everything opposite of what God is. God is mercy. I wanted to take. So I ended up writing on a piece of paper. I wrote Lucifer. Lucifer, if I give you my soul, I said, Lucifer, I will give you my soul for money, fame, and fortune. I will give you my soul and lead as many people down as to the pit. Make me the voice of my generation. And then I ended up signing it and I put some blood on it. And then I lit it up to the prince of the power of the air to receive it. And then I was just like, all right, it's done. It's it's finished. That's my fate. I'm going to burn in hell. I was okay with that. I didn't fear God. I didn't fear the Most High God. I didn't know who God was. And I didn't know He was merciful. So then about two weeks later after I did that, I was playing the guitar in um, Los Angeles. And this guy he came up to me. He was preaching the gospel at first. He had this big smile. And I was like, why is this guy smiling at me? And he gave me his time. He didn't just smile. He gave me his time. And then he started preaching the word of God to me. And at first I didn't receive it because I didn't have the Holy Spirit to even listen. I didn't have the faith to believe in the word of God. And then all of a sudden he said, Bobby, everything's going to be all right. And when my sister was little, she couldn't say the baby, so she called me the Bobby. So everyone in my family, they called me Bobby. And at first I thought I was going crazy. I thought all the different drugs I did was messing up my mind. And my mom was finally right. I lost it. But then he said, Bobby, everything's going to be all right. So then at that moment, that's when the Lord just revealed himself to me. He wasn't a God of anger. He wasn't a God that is just looking for things we do wrong. He was a God of mercy. Because I wasn't looking for God. I was looking out for myself. I wasn't looking for God. I wanted things of this world. But then God, He said, oh no, not so fast. And He took me with His hand of mercy and brought me in. 
And that's the first time I experienced true love, true mercy. I was, well, my wicked soul, he could have just said, all right, he made his decision. But he gave me another chance. And that chance was at the cross. So then as I was walking off the street, well, first off, I hugged the guy and I asked him, because I was curious, I was like, how'd you know? He said, I saw you in a dream and the Lord said to come this way today. So you don't have to be a minister to minister to people, because I don't know if that guy was a minister or not. He just had a dream. He saw the Lord and he ended up leading me to Christ. So now as I was walking off the street, I was on 333 South Hope Street. And I experienced the most hope I ever had in my life. And I was rejoicing. I was repenting. I couldn't understand that, I, that God, it was just the mercy of God. I was driven with the mercy of God. I didn't know what to do. So I just repented and praised God all down the street. And then I ended up on 333 South Hope Street. And a time before I was caught up in the darkness, I came across a verse, Jeremiah 33, 3, which is call unto Jesus Christ and he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And I made that cry before, but the Lord didn't, I didn't, my mind didn't understand how prayer works. I thought it was immediate. And then the Lord answered that desperate cry. When I um, called unto Jesus and he answered me and he showed me the cross. And the cross is a great and mighty things which we do not know. The cross is a great and hidden things. The blood of Christ is a great and hidden things. Jesus' blood is a mystery. And then I ended up wandering for two months. I was homeless, going place to place. And then I ended up stumbling upon this church in Malibu where a graduate, Brian Laspada, has a church. And the guest speaker that day was one of the pastors at Evergreen, Pastor Doug Dieter. And he was a guest speaker. He ended up speaking. And then after the service, Brian Laspot is like, hey, this kid got to go to Evergreen. And I remember seeing Jesus in Pastor Brian. Because I remember one time in a service, just like this, I stood up and I spoke something against him. He didn't say anything. He didn't rebuke me. He didn't say in the name of Jesus come out of him. After the service, he came up to me. He said, can I pray for you? Can I lay hands on you and make you teachable? And that's when I broke. Because I was acting out in rebellion. He acted out in kindness. And that broke me. And that's when I saw Jesus again through Brian. So then I ended up staying there. And I ended up going to the Evergreen Center. And for the first month, it was a whole different atmosphere. I wasn't used to a whole bunch of people praising Jesus and crying out to God with all their hearts. My prideful mind was saying, what is all these people crying out to Jesus for? But why are they doing that? I couldn't understand it. And then I would praise the Lord, but it was a kind of quiet in my flesh. I didn't give him the praise he was worthy of because he gave me great mercy. I should be breaking the roof with my voice. And everyone should, because everyone got delivered from the evil one. You don't have to write out a contract to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. You can just watch an extra hour of TV instead of praying at night. So, then one time, how I ended up becoming close to the Lord was the retreat. We had a fall retreat. And the pastors were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't know what it was. So at first I'm like, I don't need that, I'm already saved. And then I realized, I guess it was jealousy. It was like, they had it and I didn't. And I was like, I don't want it if I don't already have it. But then they ended up showing me the word of God. So then one time at the retreat, Pastor Alonzo got up and said, in these last days, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not optional. And I wanted to run to the altar right then. And then Pastor Barry ended up giving an altar call. And I ended up just waiting. The baptism of the Holy If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just say, God, give me your promise. God, have me. God, have me. And worship God and it will come. Because He's promised. He's the God who gives. So from that, 
through the baptism, I ended up seeing what God really did to me on the street that day. And uh, even opened up his um, mercy more to me. I just thank Jesus for his blood this morning. It's been a long road, but he's been carrying me this whole way. And I thank him for that. And he's worthy to be praised. And I thank Jesus for his blood. Um, next, we're going to have Philip, who is the older of the Zupke brothers. He's going to come in and give testimony of what the Lord has done in his life. And he hails from Randalia, Iowa. Well, he can pronounce that right. All right, good morning. Um, well, Anthony kind of already stole my line. I was going to come up here and say I shouldn't be here. Well, because it's true. I shouldn't be here. And it's for the same reasons. And some of the other reasons is because I did not want to be here. Um, if you were to ask me December of 2016 if I was going to be an intern at Evergreen, I would have said no. Um, if you would have asked me four years ago, I would have said no. Um, I watched my two older sisters go through it, and I saw the Lord change their life. But in the arrogance of my own heart, I said, I don't need that. I don't need to go there. I'm not going to go there. And I told my Lord, I said, God, I'm never going to go there. But God had different plans. <laughs> if you ever promise God that you're not going to do something, be very careful, because he will bring you to a place to where you don't have a choice but to listen to him. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I went to church nine months before I was born. I mean, pretty much I knew it all when it came to the Bible. We read the Bible story every night growing up. But I didn't know the Lord. And I was in bondage to myself and um, to some really dark things. And um, I actually ended up being gay saved until I was 17. And I was on a mission trip. Here I am overseas preaching the gospel. And... I realized you're not even saved. You don't understand the mercy of God. And it was through two other ladies that, um, who had testimonies that were very dark. And, um, and it was through them that I saw that the Lord can change. And because by that time I had accepted that I was never going to be changed. There was no way. I was, I was really in bondage to some dark sexual immorality. And I just thought, Lord, there's no way I'll, I'll have to deal with this the rest of my life. And through the testimony of those ladies and what the Lord did for them, I cried out and I was like, all right, God, I need you. And um, one of the verses that brought me to that spot was in Philippians 1, verse 7. And I read this in a, we were in a bus and I was kind of by myself. And this is Paul writing to the Philippians. But when I read this, it wasn't, I didn't hear it as Paul writing to the Philippians or Paul writing to me. I heard it as God talking to me. And I'll start in verse 3. It says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine. And so I'm reading this. I'm, I'm hearing Jesus speaking to me. I'm really, Jesus prays for me. In every prayer of mine, making requests for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. And then this is the verse that really hit me. And this is a little different translation than what I read in, in that night when I read it. And the translation was, it is right that I should feel this way about you, for you have a very special place in my heart. And I was like, wow. Like, I'm in your heart. Like, you think about me. And I just, I want to encourage you guys that if you don't submit to the Lord and let him work in you, he'll start breaking you down. Because even after I got saved, I still didn't want to submit to the Lord. I was still, I just idolized myself, like I, and I still do. It's, <laughs> I really do like me. Um, I'm a pretty good, I'm a pretty cool guy. Tell you what, <laughs> that's not true though. The Lord is good, and I am not. And, um... So he brought me to Evergreen, and I have to eat humble pie just about every day because every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, thank you for bringing me here, and I mean it because I am very thankful that the Lord brought me to Evergreen. And I'm not saying that that's the perfect place on earth, but it's where I needed to be. 
and the Lord knew that. And um, the Lord's teaching me humility, and it's a rough road, and sometimes I wonder if he's getting anywhere, but I'm trusting that he is. And I'll just quick read this to you guys. And This is, the disciples asked Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And when he asked that question, I'm like, ooh, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Like, that's kind of a question I would ask in my own heart. And Jesus did the unthinkable. And I think in my heart, even when I read this, I was like, he did what? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. Now, here you got all these people surrounding Jesus, and there's these kids here. These kids aren't here just to hear Jesus speak, okay? Because I'm don't I'm pretty confident that they probably didn't understand everything that he said. They just wanted to be here, be there because he was there. They wanted to be with Jesus. Now, how often do we want to be with God? Even if you don't understand everything that he says, you just want to be there because you love him. You're attracted to him. And so here's this little kid, and Jesus is like, hey, what do you think that kid's going to do? Like, no, he's like, you want me? Okay, yeah, come, I'm coming. Let's go. And he runs over. And Jesus says, as surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, I think the Lord is just teaching me, like, if you want to be humbled, you got to spend time with me. Because then I'm going to use you, and you're not even going to know that you're being used. Because that little kid probably didn't know that he was being made an example to all these older people around him whoever this kid was, he just knew that he got to sit on Jesus' lap and that was good. And that's all he wanted. So is that all you want? Is that all I want? And it's not always all I want. It's what I need. But I'm just trusting the Lord that he'll bring me to that place. So thank you. There's, to me, there's no greater miracle than to see a life transformed. Um, Praise God. <laughs> um, okay, Joel, his younger brother is going to come, and uh, he's going to share with us now. Good morning. So just in case I seem very awkward up here, this is the first time I've ever given my testimony. So, like Phil, I was born in Randalia. I was born 50 feet from where I sleep. We moved once, about 50 yards. Our house literally made an L-shape, and so I've been getting around. Um, <laughs> you know, and when I was born, you know, I was surrounded by the flock of God. You know, I, I was growing up around Christians. We went to church, you know. That's all I knew. There was no, there wasn't very much worldly influence around me. Like, the first drunk person I ever met in my life, I think it was Fort or 15, you know, and I was just like, what's wrong with him, you know, <laughs> but, so I just didn't know that, and uh, I don't remember quite exactly when I was saved, I know I was young, I think it was like six years old or something, and it was in a Christmas Eve service, and, uh, but you know, the Lord, he, the Lord helped me, and he led me to that place where I knew that I needed him, and even though I just maybe not the time understood quite how much I needed him or what exactly I needed from him. I knew that I needed him and I prayed and he led me through repentance. But then as, and so I became a sheep, I became a little lamb of God, you know, but very much like a sheep, I was dumber than a box of rocks and more curious than a batch of kittens, you know? And so it was, very, very easy for the devil to, you know, make the grass look greener on the other side. And being very young, I didn't know any better. I was just like, ooh, that looks good. And pew, you know, I was gone. And then, you know, the Lord's bringing in his sheep at the end of the night. He's like 98, 99. He's just like, where's Joe? <laughs> but he knew, he knew where I was. <laughs> and without me at the time even realizing, you know, he'd run over there and he'd bring me back. You know, my whole life growing up is... Really, I should be dead. There are times in my life where I should have died, but I didn't. I ran to a barbed wire fence with a four-wheeler. I didn't die. 
I almost got deboned by a dump truck on four-wheeler, two. Four-wheelers are bad, but I love them. <laughs> and so, but I didn't even realize how much he had kept me and how much he, though I might not have respected that commitment I made to him, he respected his side of it. And the Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he didn't. It didn't matter where I went or how far I went. The Lord always brought me back. And so that went on for 12 years, 16 years. And I just, I didn't know. And I kept running off. But then eventually when I, when I did start to realizing all of the things in my life that attracted me that were wrong, it was almost too late. Like I had already made habits. I would felt like, you know, and then I couldn't get out of them. I was just like, I tried and tried and tried, but Joel couldn't get out. And all I could ever do was just every single night before I go to bed, you know, pray, dear Lord, forgive me for all the sins I committed today, lest, you know, I die in my sleep and meet you, you know, because that was just kind of the fear I had, you know. And, uh, where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> Well, God is good. God is good. And, you know, and so through, through those habits, you know, I've always felt like I was kind of in a grave, you know, with the ends knocked out, and I just could not climb over. And I could not get out. And then, and so I was always crying out. And like Phil, I knew about Evergreen. Abby and Hannah went, and, you know, they'd come back, and I'd be like, wow, you guys are so much different. Hannah's nice. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, that's cool, and, you know. And then, you know, I went to Evergreen for the first time, and, oh, my goodness, I remember that first sermon or the first worship service. I was sat there, and everybody else is standing and just talking and crying out to God. I'm just like, I am surrounded by a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> Because, you know, I didn't grow up, that's, that's one thing in church that, you know, I didn't grow up with, you know, we're just like, we sang the song and then boom, we were done, the next song started, you know, just like, these people started a song and then it was like, three minute song, seven minutes of worshiping God, and it was just like, <laughs> but, and so, of course, I was just like, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't drag me there, <laughs> just, I would, and so, the Lord didn't drag me there, he broke my legs, and he flung me over his shoulders and he dragged me there. I didn't know I was going to Evergreen until three days before the term started. I woke up the Wednesday before that Saturday not going to Evergreen. It wasn't in my radar. There was nothing going to get me there. And then that morning happened and the Lord broke my legs and kidnapped me very, very graciously. And I am very, 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 very grateful for it. And it was at Evergreen reading through this book that I I realized what I was missing with all that. And it was through a, a book by Brother Lawrence called The Practice of the Presence, Practicing the Presence of God. And in the part of the book, he was talking about how he uh, considered himself before God and man when he prayed. And he was like, you know, it's like, I would ask God forgiveness for my sins. And then I would abandon myself into his hands so that the Lord could do what pleased him to do with me. And it hit me, that last little part, and he says, and I abandoned myself. And I was just thinking, how often that all I did, I just come to God and all I do is just ask for forgiveness. And that's all I do. It's just like, Lord, forgive me. And then he forgives me. I believed he forgave me. But I would never abandon myself to him. And so because of that, all, all I would have is his forgiveness. But I was always, always holding him out at arm's length, just like, don't get any closer. And that just, you know, we can talk from here. You know, it's just like, forgive me, you know. And then I continue on reading, and he said, I, I can't quote it forward for word, but he said, because, because he abandoned himself, he said, the Lord, it pleased the Lord, not chastising him, but he brought him into his warm embrace, and he fed him at his table, and he served him, and he loved him. And then he says, and not considered, he considered, this is Brother Owen's talk, as he was his favorite. You know, and he just, probably in a sense, he loved him with everything he had. And that was, that was near the beginning of the term that that hit me. And so it was then that I realized that I never really just abandoned myself to him. 
And so that's what I'm learning. I, <laughs> I'm not going to say that I have successfully figured out what that was all like, but I know that it is a glorious thing to be abandoned to the heart of God. And he is showing that to me very, very slowly, but very, very kindly, you know, said, and so that is my current life. And I pray that that is edifying to you. Thank you all. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, we saved the best for last. We're going to have uh, Miranda Navarro come in and share with us, and you all know where she hails from, right? All right. Miranda, come. Hi, Eddie. <laughs> Good morning. It's so grateful to be here and see all my friends, my family. Um, I honestly, up to this point, I've prayed, God, Give me a testimony to share with these people. Give give me something. Thank you. <laughs> give me something to show them that you've been doing a work in my life. Um, and we found out very early that we were coming to to Kenosha, and I was so excited, and I was even more excited because it was my birthday weekend, and um, and I always get really excited. I mean, it's your birthday. Who doesn't get excited about their birthday? But Every year I get really, really excited for my birthday and I'm like, you know, it's a day, selfishly, it's about me. It's all about me and every year it's a disappointment. Every year I get let down and I gotta say the devil has attacked me relentlessly since I've been here. Spiritually, in my mind. And yesterday was the worst day. And yesterday was my birthday. And it was the worst day ever. I felt like Job. I cursed the day that I was born. I hated it. The whole day I hated it. And I, I don't know what was going on. I just could not stop crying. I didn't know what was going on. He was just attacking me, attacking me, and showing, telling me, and I, well, we went to New York this past summer. We went to one of Frank's and his parents' home church, and the pastor there was prophesying over everyone. And you know someone's about to prophesy over you because they're just staring at you, but they're not looking at you. They're looking through you. And I'm like, please don't do that. Please don't. And the things that he said to me, and I remember it, he said, he looked at me, he's like, you're beautiful, you're smart, and you're talented. And then the last thing that he said to me was, I love you. I loved you since the first day that I saw you. And that was just... He was reading my mail. The Lord told him because those are three things that I have struggled with my entire life. I've never felt beautiful, never felt smart. I've never felt like I could offer anybody anything. And so for the Lord to say that through him, it was, it did a great work in my heart. And I felt like the Lord had still, is still looking at me. He still sees me. But one of the things that I really do struggle with is loneliness. I could be sitting in a room full of people and still feel absolutely alone. And I felt like that yesterday. I didn't care about the birthdays. I didn't care about the card or the cupcake. In fact, I wanted to throw it all away because I just didn't care. And yesterday, after everyone I came, I left because I just felt so disgusting. I went and I cleaned up and I came home and we had a time of worship and I didn't feel like it I didn't feel like worshiping at all I didn't feel like thanking him at all but you do because he's God and it doesn't matter how you feel he's still God and when we left here last night 
my brother walked me out and I just started crying again. I cried all day yesterday. My face is so tender, so sore. And I wish I could tell you, and I, I really do, I am, I want to apologize for everyone that has asked me how I'm feeling or how I'm doing. I am not good. My heart is very heavy today. And being here has just put me in the spirit of discouragement. And it has just reminded me of all the things that I have immersed myself in being here. Yesterday night after I left, Jono asked me what's wrong. I said nothing, leave me alone or whatever. And I sped off, I just drew, drew off. Didn't tell anybody where I was going, I just drove away. And last night was the first night that I ever contemplated killing myself. I really contemplated hurting and committing suicide because I just, I didn't want, just so, ugh. But then I was like, no, I'm too proud of a person to do that. I'm way too proud of that, of myself. And then, you know, Kenosha, we have a bar on every corner. And I have friends here. I have resources. I could go, you know, I had my laptop. I could easily just, and we have Wi-Fi at my house and... You know, I know places of Wi-Fi. I could easily just have gone on Facebook and messaged somebody, hey, come pick me up and let's go to the bar. And I really did consider going and grabbing a drink. I really wanted to just go out and get blackout drunk. And I didn't feel like worshiping him. But there is a plan that is bigger than myself. And just because I don't feel like worshiping him does not change the fact of who he is and the truth that he is. He is still God. And it doesn't matter how I feel. You go out there and you worship him and you thank him because he doesn't have to do anything for you. He doesn't have to. He didn't have to die on the cross for me. He didn't have to bear all my sin and my shame, but he did because he loved me. And he doesn't, he doesn't have to do any of that. But he does. So I am really, really thankful for him because he has kept me relentlessly just as much as the devil attacks me relentlessly. And I know there's people, you know, like, well, you're only 23. It doesn't, you don't know what life is. Well, that's very true. But the devil doesn't skip you just because you're young. In fact, the younger that he can take you away from God, the better. But the God is just as relentlessly, relentlessly as the devil is pursuing you, so is God. And I'm so thankful for that. And so I just want to encourage you guys with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's pray for Miranda. She's a... Uh, a beautiful sister in the Lord, and we truly do consider it an honor just to have you in our lives. So if you extend your hand out to her. Jesus, our comforter, our peace. Father, you are more for us than we could ever do for ourselves. You have given us life. You have given us understanding when we don't know what's going on. God, your spirit, you impart to us everything necessary for today, Jesus. So, Father, today, for all of the evergreen, for everyone in this room, Father, give us today our daily bread. Help today, Jesus. The chaos of the day, help it to, to pass away. Jesus, exalt yourself in our life. God, that you give Miranda, and not just Miranda, anyone who is going through anything. Father, her testimony is not just hers. It is what you are doing through her. So, Father, anyone else who is dealing with similar issues, going through similar trials, Father, would you send the peace of God to them as you have sent to Miranda? Father, we know that it is going to be okay when we are with you. Whether we pass from this life or not, our eternity is set. We have hope in you. There is always hope found in your name, Jesus. So, Father, by the grace 
of your spirit impart that hope to each and every one of us that there would be no one to leave this place today and not know a personal, deep relationship with Jesus Christ. You, Father, who gave everything for us. You, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. So, Father, I thank you for Miranda. I thank you for the beautiful soul that she is. Father, I thank you for the testimony that you are going to work out in her life, that she is going to one day be able to stand in front of hundreds and say, but my God, but my God has saved me. My God pulled me out of this, and he can do it for you. Let me introduce you to my God. Father, speak victory over her. Jesus, speak hope over her. Bring life to her in deep, meaningful ways, Jesus. God, there has to be more to life than this. And there is in your name. So, Father, through your peace, through your comfort, through your mercy, speak to each and every one of us today through the rest of this service, Father. And start that personal work. Father, in this very moment, start that personal work that you are going to continue and see it through to the end. Father, open the ears. Open the eyes, open the minds, the hearts of all of us today, Jesus. As your word comes forth, speak to us, Father, in very deep, meaningful ways, very true ways. Help us to open ourselves to your word this morning, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. Pastor Lonzo. Thank you. Praise the Lord. The Lord is here. Um, and when the Lord comes, it's in power and love. And he's here to minister to hearts and lives. So don't, don't leave here if the Lord is speaking to your heart and wants to do something. Okay? One of the areas that we talk about in Evergreen in these last days one of the spirits that we believe that the Lord wants to get at is this I know spirit. You know, we always say that, like, it's a knee-jerk response. I know this, I know that, and we don't know. You know, really, only God knows. But I want to share with you some scriptures about things we do need to know, okay? Because they come from the heart of God. Um, we know that, that knowledge puffs off, but what does love do? It, it edifies, doesn't it? And it brings us to the place where we need to be. And I want to look at Judges chapter 15, 11, and there, there's several scriptures I'm going to go through. Um, but it says here that there was 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Phil Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to you. There's always this question in our hearts and minds when things are stirred up by the enemy that we don't want to deal with them. Samson, if you'd have just left things the way they were, we wouldn't be in this situation. But how often are we confronted with situations in our own lives when our flesh is stirred up? And we don't like it. What do we do? How do we respond? You know, the question should have been, do you not know that the Lord wants to set us free? But we often say in our hearts, man, just let sleeping dogs lie. Don't bother. I like myself the way I am. But we've heard testimony that the Lord is not satisfied with the status quo. He's not satisfied with us just being the way that we are because he has a plan, a plan for each and every one of us, that we all be conformed to the image of his son. And that means that there's certain things in your heart and life that need to be dealt with by the Spirit. And so when those things come to the fore, you should be thanking the Lord. 
We heard testimony that there's things in people's lives that need to be touched, and only the Lord can touch them. There is no self-help that's going to make the difference. We can will ourselves well, but it's never going to happen until we recognize that it's only the Lord through the power of his Holy Spirit that any change, any meaningful change that comes about in our lives is going to be because of his love and power. You see, Jesus came for the expressed reason to give us victory. Zechariah said in his prophecy in Luke, he says, Jesus came to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's a promise. That's why Jesus came. And do you think that was an empty promise? No, that's his will for each and every one of us. That's his heart's desire. And so the flesh has to go, right? So his spirit can live through us. Do you not know that it was for freedom that we have been set free? Free to do what? To serve the Lord. To serve one another in love. And the freer we are, folks, the greater we can love one another. Brethren, we have been called to liberty. Only do not use the liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You know, our enemies are stirred up, folks, that, so that the Lord can defeat them and bring us into a greater freedom and liberty that will express itself in love. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Everything else is going to pass away, and what's going to be left is love. The litmus test for each and every one of us is how much do we love? And it's how much do we love one another? How much do we love our enemies? And since we're born with a nature that does not know how to love, what needs to happen? We need someone to teach us. And the one who is love will teach us how to love. We're so selfish. We're so me-centered, right? It's me, myself, and I. And that has to go. So that the power of God's love can flow through you to others. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that it will be bitter in the end? How long will it be then until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brethren? Folks, if there's one thing that's going to destroy the believer in these last days, it's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Peter asked Jesus, Is there a limit to the number of times one forgives another? Peter thought the limit was seven. And the Lord responds that, no, it's 470 times. And who's going to keep track of that? But he's telling us that our unforgiveness is unlimited. No matter what somebody does to you, no matter what they say to you, you have a responsibility to forgive. And I know sometimes it's extremely difficult. But I think the one who has called us to forgiveness will give us the strength and power so that we can forgive. And it may not happen overnight. It may be a process. But you can forgive. Jesus went on to say after Peter had asked that question, it was a parable about a servant who had owed a debt that he could never, ever pay in a lifetime. But he was forgiven, unconditionally. The slate was wiped clean. 
the debt was no longer owed. This astronomical amount had been forgiven him, and what does he do? He goes out and finds someone who owes him just a pittance and said, listen, you need to pay me back now. And that individual didn't have the resources to repay, so he was thrown into jail. And some other servants heard about it and went back and told the slave's master about how he treated a former or a fellow servant. And he was angry. Angry because he had been forgiven so much. And yet, he wouldn't forgive just a small thing that someone had done to him. Folks, the blood of Jesus Christ has paid an astronomical debt for each and every one of us. In fact, there is no way that we could ever pay that debt if we lived a million lifetimes. He said, if you had it all, everything in the world, it wouldn't pay for one drop of that blood to save your soul. You see, the blood of Christ is priceless. So now we have a responsibility, do we not, to go out and forgive others. But, but here's the bottom line I want you to hear. You see, if we are not willing to forgive, our Heavenly Father is not willing to forgive us. He takes it all back. All the forgiveness that He's extended to us, if we are not willing to forgive one another, then we're not forgiven. That's heavy, isn't it? But I think the Lord is serious about this. In these last days, folks, there's going to be lots of things that go on to hurt us, to cut us to the core. Family, friends, loved ones, employees, employers. Relationships are going to be hurtful. But the Lord who loves and wants us to love, is going to help you to be able to forgive from your heart. And I think of that example of Corey Tim Boom, who saw her sister die at the hands of a gruesome, gruesome internment. And she was bitter and angry because of what the Germans had done to her sister. And Corrie ten Boom lived through it all and began to give testimony of how God had delivered and set her free through all of this. And one day a German guard came up to her, who she recognized. And he asked, would you forgive me? And it was extremely difficult to raise her hand, but she said, you know what? The Holy Spirit empowered me to reach out and shake this man's hand and say, I forgive you. It's not easy. But in the Lord, things that are impossible with us are possible with him. So I want you to understand and know that it is an awesome responsibility to forgive. It's an awesome responsibility to learn how to love. But don't you know this is what God has called to, called each of us to in these last days. So whatever someone does to you, whatever fence, whatever rub, forgive them. All right? It's for your own health and well-being. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 13, this is when Sennacherib was king of Assyria, and he sent some servants to Jerusalem to let them know that they're next on the list for destruction. And it says, Do you not know that I and my fathers, or do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of the other land? Were the gods of the nations of these land in any way able to deliver their hand, or deliver their lands out of my hand? So it's easy, folks, for us 
To listen to the lies of the enemy. To listen to the lies or the father of lies who is speaking to us in these last days. Don't you know that I have power over you? He has no power. Do you know what? This same enemy, when Jesus was standing before Pilate, and he says, don't you know, Jesus, I have power to release you. And Jesus says, you know what? You have no power unless it's been given to you. There's going to be a lot of things said in these last days about what someone can do to you. But you need to rest on the fact that Jesus is the one that sits on the throne. That all authority and all power is in his hands. Nothing happens without him. And so you can rest assured that whatever the enemy says to you, you can say right back, but... The Lord is the one that's calling the shots. You know, there are so many examples of men who have been placed in situations where, which seem to be insurmountable. I can't imagine being thrown in the den of, of I guess, man-eating lions. And I guess once they get a taste of human blood, look out. But Daniel was in there all night because he knew who sat on the throne. Do you know who sits on the throne? And I, I, do you really know that he has all power in heaven and earth? Do you believe that in your heart? Paul was encouraged by God at the beginning of his ministry that he would be delivered from the Jews as well as the Gentiles. That was God's call in his life. And once God places a call on your life, no matter where you go, he will see you get there. When the disciples were in the boat and they were going to cross the Sea of Galilee and a storm came, and I believe it was a mother of all storms, because Peter, James, and John were fishermen. That's how they made their living. They knew what it was like to fish on the Sea of Galilee. They knew what it was like when all these storms came along. But this was a storm in which they felt they were going to lose their lives. And so they wake the Lord up and say, we're going to perish. And so the Lord speaks a word and the storm is quelled and the sea becomes calm and the winds die down. And this comment where is your faith. I'm the one that said, let's get in the boat and go across. And when the Lord tells us that this is where we're going to go, it doesn't make any difference how bad the storm is. The Lord is going to see us to the other side. The Lord has made some promises to us and he is going to be the one that's going to keep each and every one of those promises to you. And you don't have to worry about the storm. You don't have to worry about what the devil says or what he thinks. The Lord is going to see you through. It says in 2 Peter, he says, Don't you know that the Lord knows how to deliver us from every evil temptation? We heard about that this morning. There was a temptation, folks. But the Lord had the final say. And the Lord will have the final say in your life too. He said, I am not going to allow you to go through any temptation in which you cannot endure. In these last days, folks, we're going to be bombarded with all kinds of temptations. But we have to rest assured, folks, that the Lord is going to set us free and deliver us from each and every one. Do you not know, it says in Romans 6.3, that as many as of us were baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death. 
Do you not know, folks, that we have been made new creatures in Christ Jesus? We're a new creation. We've been born again. We have a past, a present, and we will have a future because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Do you know that you are a new creation and all the things that happened in the past are done with? The blood has covered them. He's forgiven you. You are new. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we are a new creation, folks, then we have a, a new responsibility to no longer live for ourselves, but for him who gave himself for us, freely and willingly. And can we get to the place where we willingly and freely give ourselves to him? I hope so. We are kept safe by God because we have been deposited in Jesus. For your life is hidden with Christ in God. And that word there means to be hidden or concealed. Preventing someone from being harmed by being kept safe and protected. That's what the Lord is doing for us in these days. He is making a place where we'll be safe so that he can do the work in our hearts and lives. And you say, well, what about all the people dying? Folks, that's just a time of transition. We are in life now. To know him is to have eternal life. That's what life is. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And death is to be severed from that relationship. But now that we're a new creation and we've been united to Christ Jesus, we are in life. So don't worry about dying. Right? <laughs> because as soon as we die, we go to live with him forever in his presence. The Lord will keep you safe in a relationship with him. He will tie you to himself because he loves you. Jesus is the one that has promised to do everything that we could not do. That's why we got rid of the old covenant, because it had this human element in it. Will you do it? Yeah, 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 I'll do it. <laughs> and come to find out we couldn't do it. But Jesus has come because he did it. And he'll make sure, folks, if you stick with him, that you'll do it. Praise the Lord. Do you know that Jesus has called us to be bond slaves? And bond slaves are different than, than slaves. Slaves are forced into slavery. Bond slaves voluntarily submit themselves to the one who loves them. Have you surrendered your heart and life to the Lord completely and totally and you have told him, I am yours. I will do whatever you ask. I want you to think about that. Because in the past, the Lord has asked for some things that are extremely difficult. Abraham, I promise to give you a son from your own flesh. And 25 years later, the Lord made good on that promise. And then about 12 years later, the Lord asked him to go on Mount Moriah and offer that son up as a sacrifice. Now, I could come up with a thousand reasons why not. You made a promise. You fulfilled your promise. If this one is gone, then your promise is dead. But Abraham, what does he do? He gets up the next morning, gets all the materials, and takes off. 
because he believed that God could raise him from the dead. God may ask you to go some places and do some things that may seem absolutely crazy to the natural mind. But with that, the Lord is going to empower you folks to accomplish what he's asked you to do. Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to say yes? Are you willing to perform as a bondservant and submit to him? It says in Romans 6.20 that we were all slaves to sin, but now we have been free in regard to righteousness. We can't serve two masters, folks. We can only serve one master. And we are kept from the power of sin that we might walk before the Lord in blamelessness. Do you not know that you are under grace and not law? There's a huge difference. Oftentimes we have little laws. And we take those laws and we try to impose them on one another because we feel that they're the right thing to do. But the Lord is freeing us up, folks, so that we'll listen to him and him alone. And he'll decide what's right and what's wrong. That's his prerogative. But there are some laws that each and every one of us in these last days need to abide by. One is the law of spirit the law of the spirit of life. It's through this law of the spirit of life that Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. In Romans 3.27 it says, Where is boasting? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. There's a law of faith that if we're ever going to please God in these last days, it's going to have to be because we live by faith and not by sight. We understand that this temporal world is going to go one day, and all that's left is going to be what is permanent, and that's the Lord. In James chapter 1, verse 25, it says, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is a forgetful hearer, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The perfect law of liberty. It's a law of freedom in Christ Jesus. And he talks about another law in James chapter 2. He talks about the royal law which is a love for one another. And lastly, I don't know, I think this is probably one of the most important New Testament laws that the Lord has asked us to live in and um, manifest to one another in these last days. And it's found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens so that we would fulfill the law of Christ. Oh, praise the Lord. You know, the Lord is bringing us into these elements as we walk with him. You know, no matter where we are in our relationship with the Lord, no matter how, quote, 
good we feel we are because of our walk with the Lord. We always have farther to go. Do you know? It's, it's, a, it's a never ending walk, a never ending pursuit to follow after the Lord. But it's so easy to begin to look at, at others and say, well, that's not where I am. You know, this is what I do, this is what's happened to me, and the list goes on and on. And I think that's what happened to Elijah. Lord, look at all the stuff I'm doing for you. And everybody has denied you. <laughs> and the Lord had to remind him, you know what, Elijah? I've got some folks tucked away. You have absolutely no idea who and where they are. The Lord always has a remnant, folks. In these last days especially, we're going to see that the Lord has a remnant. Those who have been tucked away that are serving him with all their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. And I'm so reminded of Anna, who had been married for seven years and for 84 years went to the temple on a daily basis to pray and intercede. Whoever noticed her, whoever would recognize her, who would ever give her a second thought? But the Lord was truly in love with her. See, it's not the big, bright calling that God has for us, but it's one who is obedient and faithful to him, that he truly has a design and a hand upon, and that'll be so in these last days. <clears throat> Folks, it's in him we're going to find our completeness, you know? It tells us in Hebrews that the God of peace who brought up the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, will make you complete in every good work, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever. Amen. The Holy Spirit is working in you so that you will do what is pleasing to God. That's all of us. Are you going to hinder that work? Are you going to grieve the Holy Spirit? Are you, dis, are you just going to disobey what he has to say, what he wants you to do? Because that's going to stop the flow. Sin always stops the flow. So I hope that you understand that the one who's given this promise that's doing a work in your heart and life wants to bring you along for his glory and honor. And in the end, he'll look at you and say, that's one of my trophies. That's one who surrendered their heart and life to me. That's one who gave themselves to me totally and completely. And I was able to live my life through them for his glory and honor. Amen. <clears throat>